Hello, and thanks for taking the time to learn about bees. Today we're going to learn how you can tell if your honeybee colonies are safe from the varroa mite, or if they are at risk. My name is Megan Milbreth, and I work in honeybee extension and research at Michigan State University. I've been keeping bees since I was about 12, and most of my time is spent working with bees, talking about bees, or reading about bees. I really love bees and beekeeping, and I'm really passionate about helping other beekeepers keep their bees happy and healthy. Last year, I received a USDA NEFA grant for critical agriculture research and extension. This funding is designed to support agricultural issues that are critical. I and a group of researchers and extension educators from around the country realized how critical the issue of varroa is for small-scale beekeepers. Thousands of honeybee colonies around the country continue to die from these deadly parasites. Together, we received funding to start projects to help beekeepers keep their colonies safe from this pest. This funding allowed us to develop MiteCheck.com, which is a database where citizens can report their mite levels and see mite dynamics around the country, so check it out. We are also able to start the Keep Bees Alive campaign, which is designed to help beekeepers keep their bees safe and healthy and thriving from year to year. This is the second of a series of three videos. The first video, Why Did My Bees Die?, is posted on our YouTube channel, Michigan State University Beekeeping, and is available at keepbeesalive.org. The third video will be on management strategies and will be a recording of a live webinar session from June 26, 2018. If you still have time, you can register for the live session at keepbeesalive.org. If you miss the live session, it will be posted shortly after on our channel and on our site. Now to Varroa. Varroa destructor, or the Varroa mite, is a terrible pest of honeybees. It has caused the death of millions of bees and has left many beekeepers disheartened and frustrated. One of the biggest tools you can gain as a beekeeper is to understand whether or not your colony is at risk from this pest. A few years ago, before I understood Varroa dynamics, I felt like the health of my bees was entirely based on luck. I would really hope that my bees would survive, but it would feel like roulette when I went out to check them in the winter. Now that I have a better understanding of varroa biology, and I have the tools to show me the level of risk, I feel way more confident in their survival. There's a very big difference between hoping that my bees are okay and knowing that my bees are okay. Now I not only have way better survival in my bees, but I also have peace of mind regarding their health. I created this webinar to help you bring the same peace of mind and to increase survival for your bees. I'll cover the basics of varroa biology and dynamics, and I'll give you some tools to monitor pest populations. No need to just cross your fingers and hope. You can be confident that your bees are healthy. Varroa mites are terrible pests. They feed on developing bees, causing damage during the delicate pupal stage. Not only do they cause physical damage to the bees, but they also transmit a host of viruses. The mites are quite large in comparison to the bee, as we can see on this poor worker. We can also see her deformed wings, caused by the varroa-transmitted deformed wing virus. Because they are so destructive, the mites can quickly overwhelm a hive, causing most colonies to die within 18 months. One main reason that the varroa mite is so deadly to our honeybee is because it's new. It's an emerging infectious disease in the United States. Varroa have only been present in the United States since the mid-1980s, which is not enough time for our bees to develop natural defenses or to reach a host parasite balance. Varroa destructor was originally found on the eastern honeybee, Apis serrana. This is a totally different species of honeybee than ours, native to Asia. Beekeepers started to bring our honeybee, the western honeybee, Apis mellifera, to the places where the eastern honeybee lived and the varroa quickly jumped onto these new hives. The biology of the two honeybee species is similar enough that the varroa could thrive in its new host. However, while Apis serrana has some natural checks for the varroa population due to its biology, Apis mellifera, our honeybee, does not have those checks. So varroa is a normal type pest in the eastern honeybee, but goes out of control in the western honeybee. The mites quickly spread around the United States and around the world and are basically still not controlled. We are now in an epidemic of varroa mites and the viruses that they transmit. If you're a beekeeper in North America in 2018, you'll have to deal with varroa mites in your colonies, well except if you live on some remote islands. This is just an unfortunate fact about where we are with beekeeping in this moment. It's in the middle of an epidemic. The pest is prevalent all over the country and it's easily spread, so it's safe to assume that your colonies are at risk for infestation. Varroa are very likely to infest your hives, and there are a lot of factors that will determine the outcome after infestation. The level of risk is determined by the disease pressure in the environment. 
How many mites are in nearby hives? Do you have a neighbor whose colony collapsed? Are there feral colonies with unchecked mites nearby? Even if you don't think that there's colonies nearby, it's very common for there to be other hives in the flight zone of your bees. The level of parasites and the particular viruses that they carry will change over the season and will change from year to year. While it's expected that you will have a risk of mites moving in, that doesn't mean that you will lose the colony. You can have a pest in the environment, but that doesn't mean your animal has to die from it. While you can't know the environmental risk in your area, you can make sure that your animal is not harmed by it. Your job as a beekeeper is to make sure that your honeybee colonies are in good health, which indicates monitoring for parasites and disease. You want to know that your bees are healthy, and if they are sick with parasites, you want to be able to manage disease and to bring your bees back into good health as quickly as possible. First, I'm going to cover some biology because it's really important for understanding mite dynamics. The infestation starts by a female mite entering the hive on the back of a drone or a forager. You may have some mites in the hive that came with your original packages or nukes, but we also know that mites enter the hive throughout the season. Mites have a wax cuticle like bees do. It can pick up the hive scent and basically move through the hive undetected. It's common to see insects like ants immediately driven out from the hive because the bees recognize them as intruders. Because the mites have this chemical camouflage, they don't automatically get removed. The mites try to get on a nurse bee as quickly as possible because those are the bees that are going to bring them close to the larva. Using scent, the mite can detect the ages of the bees and jump to a nurse bee who will take her to the brood nest. When the mite comes across a cell that has a mature larva, it will jump in and hide in the royal jelly to evade the bees. It will use a specialized snorkel-like structure called a paratreme while it is buried in the royal jelly so it can survive until the cell is capped and it is free to move around. Once the cell is capped, the female mite will cut a hole in the larva and begin to feed on it. This is where the mites transmit viruses to the bees. A lot of the viruses that the mites transmit are often found in the hive, but they only cause disease when they're injected in this fashion. You can have these viruses present in the hive, but you won't actually see the bees getting sick. This is also the period that's causing physical damage in this very delicate stage of pupation for the bee. 70 hours after capping, the female mite lays an egg. You can see an egg in this cell. Also note the little varroa toilet in the corner. Remember from the Why Did My Bees Die video that this is a good way to see if varroa have been in your brood cells. The first egg will hatch and will become a male. The female will then lay a succession of females about every 30 hours. These females will mature and they will mate with the male, which is their brother. Here's a family photo of what you would expect to see in a cell when the bee pupa is at the purple-eyed stage. You can see the dark red original female, the smaller male, an egg, and a few developing females. If the bee were to close at this moment, the only original female would survive. The white developing mites are too delicate at this stage. By the time the bee normally emerges, one new female mite will have developed enough to survive. Because drones take longer to develop, two new mites can emerge from each drone cell. The original reproductive female also emerges and can go on to reproduce more times. All of the reproduction occurs under the cappings. This is important to remember for two reasons. First, you simply won't see the mites in your hives. Most of the damage will be under the cappings and hidden from your eyes, even if you're doing a really good inspection. The second reason that is important to understand is because the more brood that you have, the more mites you can make. Remember the first video, Why Did My Bees Die? It's your biggest colonies that are most at risk. This is because they have the most places for the mites to reproduce. It's easy for each reproductive female to quickly find larvae of the right age and start again raising a little varroa family. Because each female mite can lay at least one reproductive female, and each one of those daughters can lay at least one more reproductive female, we get exponential growth. This means that we would expect the population of mites to be smaller in the early season and then to explode later in the season. This is a super important point, so if you're getting snoozy, now's the time to pay attention. Normal varroa dynamics are that you have colonies with low varroa in the spring and early summer that have exploding parasite populations later in the season. This timing is really important. First, as you can see from this figure, this peak can coincide with your bees raising less brood to prepare for winter. So you have more mites and fewer developing bees, so a greater proportion of the bees become parasitized. During the summer, the sick bees may not be such an issue because you have so many healthy summer bees to keep the colony functioning. The ratio of healthy bees drops as these bees normally die off and fewer bees are made, then the colony will start to struggle. 
This is the worst because just at the moment that we have these exploding varroa populations, our winter bees are becoming formed. So in the summertime, our bees live for a few weeks and then they die. But before winter, our colony creates special bees with different fat profiles and different hormones. They are designed to live for months and to make it through a long winter, a really stressful period with no cleansing fights and no fresh food. So the only way that a colony survives winter is by having a healthy cluster of these specialized winter bees. So to review, varroa mites move into our hives through the summer at a rate that is determined by your particular location. These mites experience exponential growth due to reproduction in the capped brood. The colony can sustain a few mites, but if they get overcome with parasites, they become profoundly ill. Bees that are heavily parasitized by varroa cannot raise enough healthy bees to survive the winter. Remember this from the other video, when we saw little clusters indicating that bees were too sick and stressed to survive once the stress of winter set in. Your goal as a beekeeper is to make sure that the mite population never explodes. We can't predict how many mites will be in our area and how many will come into our hives, but we can make sure that they never take over and risk the life of our colony. But I didn't see any mites in my hive, you'll say. Remember that most of the mites are under the cappings. You shouldn't be able to see them. If you could see through cappings, that would be really weird. Also, when the mites are not under the cappings and they're on the adult bees, they're often underneath the bees, in between the segments. They're really hard to spot on a normal inspection. Remember that looking is not the same as monitoring. If you don't see any mites, it does not mean that your bees are safe. You can have thousands of varroa mites in your colony, but not see any on inspection. By the time you see mites in your colony, it's usually too late. It means that the mite population has started to peak and has overcome the bees. In order to determine if our colony is at risk, we need a system that will let us know if we have a high level of mites per bee or percent infestation. Remember that we're interested if the colony is overcome with mites, meaning that there won't be enough healthy bees for the colony to function. There are two methods that allow us to do this, the sugar roll and the alcohol wash. They both have the same principle. You take a known number of bees, knock the mites off, and then count the number of mites per 100 bees. They both have about equal accuracy. The alcohol wash is a little faster. The sugar roll takes a little longer to learn, but you can get an accurate count either way. Some techniques can allow us to see the mites, but they won't give us an answer in terms of percent infestation, so it's harder to use those tools to make decisions. For example, many people like to open drone brood to see if there are mites underneath. This is really variable, and it's possible that you could open a lot of brood, but not get a good understanding of your risk. Many people also like to use sticky boards to identify mites in a hive. This involves putting a coated board underneath a colony with a screen bottom and counting the number of mites that fall. This is a really useful tool to check if a treatment worked, but it doesn't account for the size of the colony, so it's hard to use this information to make decisions about what needs to be done next. We recommend doing an alcohol wash or sugar roll to test for mites. You can buy a kit at the bee supply stores. Here's a tool that can be used for the alcohol wash and an awesome pre-made kit for doing a sugar roll. You can also make your own kit. The important parts are a container, something to knock the mites off the bees, either the alcohol or the sugar, a half cup scoop, a jar, and something that has holes for the mites to go through, but not the bees. You want to monitor for mites at least once per month to ensure that the population hasn't taken off. The most important time of year is in the late summer when your populations are expected to be high and when your winter bees are being formed. Depending where you are, this is usually August or September. In the next few slides, I'm going to walk you through the steps for monitoring for mites using a sugar roll. We'll post other resources at keepbeesalive.org as well, so you can see some other videos of the process in action. The first step is to go down in the broodness of the hive. You want to find nurse bees because that's where you expect to find the most mites. There's some people that sample from higher up, but keep in mind you may be underestimating the mites in your hive. You want to take about a half cup of bees. There are two ways you can do this. One method is to use a cup to scoop the bees off the frame. Here I'm using the cup that came in the mite check sugar roll kit, which has flat sides that makes this process much easier. The second method is to shake the bees into a tub so that you can scoop them out of the tub. Don't worry if some bees fly away at this point. They're the older foragers and you're really interested in the nurse bees. This thumping method may not work if you have a lot of nectar in the frame. You can have nectar spill on the bees, which will make them sticky if you're using the powdered sugar. If you're using the alcohol, obviously this won't be a problem. 
and you put the bees into a container with a screen lid. This is where you need to add something to knock off the varroa. If you're using powdered sugar, add a couple heaping hive tools worth. The exact amount isn't important, you just need to make sure that the bees are well coated. If you're using alcohol, you need to make sure that the bees are completely covered. Roll the bees gently to make sure that they are well coated with sugar. If you're using alcohol, you would swirl the container well to make sure that it's able to wash around all the bees. If you're doing a sugar roll, let the bees sit for two minutes in the shade. This is a really important step. It's during this step that the bees heat up and the mites fall off the bees. The sugar just prevents the mites from climbing back on. If you don't let the bees sit for long enough, it's likely that you will underestimate the mites. If you notice the bees start to look wet at this point, you'd want to start over. The bees should be dry and coated with white sugar. If you're doing an alcohol wash, there's no need to let the bees sit. Shake the mites through the screen into a container. You want to shake the mites pretty hard and for a long enough time to fully dislodge all the mites. I shake for a full minute and I do it hard enough that I feel kind of bad about it. Most alcohol wash kits have an inner cup that you can remove so that you can just leave the bees right out, leaving the mites and the alcohol behind. The mites in the bottom from the sugar roll will be covered with sugar, so you can use some water to rinse it off so you can see them. If you use alcohol, you should be able to see them just fine. So count any mites that you can see. There's no shame in bringing a magnifying glass for this step if you need to. We assume that there's about 300 mites in a half cup of bees, so you want to divide by three to get your mites for 100 bees, or your percent infestation. Here's a close-up of some mites. Note that they are cinnamon colored and slightly oval shaped. There are often other materials in the container, but they won't have as smooth edges. How many mites are too many? Like most things in beekeeping, there's no precise answer. It will depend a lot on where you're located and how much season is left. We often start to see signs of disease around 5% infestation, so many extension experts use 3% as a safe level. If you have less than a 3% infestation, your bees are likely fine for now. If you are above 5%, it's likely that they're already experiencing some disease. If you're above 10%, the colony is in very poor health and could be a risk to other colonies in the area. Remember that these numbers are not set in stone, and you should be measuring often to know that your bees are always in good shape. If you have a 3% infestation in the early spring, you're technically in a safe area, but that's pretty high for so early in the season. Remember that they're going to grow exponentially as time goes on. I live in southern Michigan. I've been monitoring for only a few years, but the typical pattern that I see is that I'll only see one or two mites in a sample through early July. This is less than 1% infestation. In early August, I'll start to see a few more, and by mid-August, if I do nothing, the population will really take off and will definitely be above threshold by the end of the month. Just think about these numbers for a second. Let's say that I have a colony with 50,000 bees in it at the end of the summer. If I have three mites per 100 bees, that's 1,500 mites on the bees in the colony. Most estimates are that half the mites are under the cappings at any one time, which means that there would be closer to 3,000 mites in that colony. And that's a colony that's considered healthy, and where it would be perfectly normal not to see any mites or to see any signs of disease yet. You can record the numbers that you find in your sugar roll or alcohol wash at mycheck.com. This helps us researchers understand the dynamics of varroa from all over the country. You can also check the map there to see if other people in your area are finding high levels of mites so you'll know if you're at risk. In conclusion, varroa mites are all over the United States and they transmit a lot of deadly viruses. These viruses have very high death rates for colonies. If you don't know the number of mites in your colonies, you can't know for sure if it's safe. Your bees really do deserve to be kept free from these parasites. If you're choosing to be a beekeeper, you want to make sure that your animal is in good health and is not overridden with parasites and deadly viruses. Thanks so much for taking the time out of your day to learn with me. In the next webinar, I'll discuss what you can do to keep your bees safe from the varroa mites and what to do if we find colonies that are overrun with these pests. You can find more information at keepbeesalive.org. Thanks again and wishing you all the best to you and your bees.